Okay. How about general urinary symptoms of menopause, which includes incontinence? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, menopause, a lot of women associate menopause with having hot flashes. That's kind of their, and the cessation of periods. I think that's what is common if you ask the average woman, what is menopause? They say, well, that's when the periods end, and some people have hot flashes. Um, I think what's less known to the average person is what happens to the pelvis when the ovaries start to shut down. So what happens is your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone go down, and the vulvar tissues, which are very, very estrogen and testosterone dependent, become atrophied or dry or irritated or more prone to infections. So you see this huge spike in urinary tract infections, incontinence, painful sex, um, all these pelvic conditions that women don't traditionally correlate with menopause because they're just not educated to know that that is part of, of menopause. So we used to say, oh, you have incontinence or you have urinary tract infections or you have painful sex, but now it's kind of an encompassing condition called genital urinary symptoms of menopause. And a lot of women do not know that that is actually a medical condition and all of those things kind of come, can come together instead of all these isolated problems that they think they're having. Um, what are the um, what are the options? Um, are, are you talking about incontinence specifically? Yes. Okay. Well, for all of them, right? Yeah. So incontinence specifically depends upon the type of incontinence that they have. Um, so if you leak when you cough, sneeze, laugh, that's stress incontinence. The mainstay for that is pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, if pelvic floor physical therapy doesn't help, or say the incontinence is extreme, then you talk about doing surgery. Most traditionally, the midurethral sling is the gold standard outpatient surgery for that, 85% successful. Um, we have an in-house pelvic floor physical therapist. We've teamed up with core physio, Elizabeth Hampton, and they provide excellent physical therapy, but there are other companies in town that also do excellent women's physical therapy. Um, so that's stress incontinence, and then there's overactive bladder, which is kind of the unwanted desire to urinate too much. So I gotta go all the time, I know where all the toilets are between here and Seattle, uh, I can't sit through a movie without stopping to urinate, or I might leak on the way to the, to the bathroom, so you're, you just can't get there in time, which inc becomes incredibly important the older people get, and they're just not functionally as fast as they used to be, so that bladder really jumps ahead of them. And they say, God, every time I just like think about using the bathroom, I get this huge urge. So that's more overactive bladder. Again, first line treatment is pelvic floor physical therapy um, to work on retraining the brain bladder connection to say, okay, when I get that urge, what muscles can I engage to kind of get that urge to go down? Um, very effective. The downside with it is, is a woman has to do the exercises, right? And some women are very motivated to do that, uh, but some need a little bit more help. So the medications are second line. These are all just national guidelines. Uh, so first line is pelvic floor physical therapy. Second line is medications. The most commonly known medications are oxybutynin, ditropan. The side effects are dry mouth and constipation, and nobody likes that. They always say, I'm already taking too many meds, and I'm already constipated. I already have dry mouth from all my meds. So medications aren't the most popular option, but insurance companies and national guidelines say that's second before we go any more invasive for that. So pelvic floor, then medications, and then third line treatments. So we do a lot of third line treatments in our clinic because we're the urology clinic and they kind of come here when they've already exhausted the other options. Um, and the two main ones that we do are Botox and inner stim. So Botox is the same, uh, onobotulinum toxin is the generic name of it. Botox is very well known for facial cosmetic and how it works is it relaxes our muscles. So we have less wrinkles, that's how it works cosmetically, but it relaxes the bladder muscles so it doesn't have as strong of a squeeze. So women say, I just have more time to get to the bathroom. That's the classic with Botox, is I just have more time to get to the bathroom. Um, the other nice thing about Botox is that you really only have to have it applied twice a year. So you're not in here a lot for a lot of treatments. You don't have to take a pill every day. You don't have to remember to take a medic. You don't have to remember to do your exercises. You really just come in, get your Botox. I have plenty of women who maybe live in Arizona, so they'll get their Botox, they'll go winter somewhere, and they, like, they call when they come back to Bellingham, and they get their Botox for the spring. Um, so very, very effective uh, treatment for urge incontinence. And, and insurance covers it really great, because you're all FDA approved uh, treatments. And then InnerStim is a little uh, generator that sits on the bladder nerve and actually calms down the bladder. 
Um, so I, I save that for women who maybe they think coming in twice a year is too much. They don't like the idea of Botox or they just want something that's more permanent because it'll last about five years. So that just sits uh, kind of in the lower back, just sits on the belt of the bladder nerve and just kind of gives the bladder a new kind of more mellow signal to listen to. So sometimes it's not the bladder muscles problem, it's the nerve problem. So that treats the nerve that kind of tells the bladder how responsive to be. Um, so we do a couple of those every week too. Um, so that's that's our incontinence story. Okay. Yeah. Um, with the Botox, where do you actually inject it? In the bladder. Okay. Yeah. So internally? Mm -hmm. Yep, so we come to our surgery center and you lay down and we put some numbing jelly in the bladder and we just re have you read a book or play on your phone for 10 minutes while it just kind of numbs the bladder. And we have a warm blanket and we have the lights down so it's just more kind of like a spa experience than like as clinical. It's just, it's just helping you know people's comfort, right? And then I come in with a little camera so I can actually see it precisely where I put it and that takes about a minute to do. And then you go home. The nice thing about it is you drive yourself, you can eat breakfast, there's no prep, there's no anesthesia. I think some of the happiest people who come through our surgery center are our Botox ladies, because we really try to make it as much of a spa relaxing as we can. Um, and they kind of, once they know what to expect, they love their Botox because they know how well it works. And you can tell when it's wearing off because your bladder just kind of starts to go back to how it was. Okay. And um, for the interstem, they have to come back every five years. And do those batteries kind of... Um, yeah, they just wear out. Yeah. So, but it takes five years for that. Depends upon what setting you have it on. Yeah. Okay. But that's nice. I have a couple of women who are on Botox, but they're like, hey, you know what? I, I don't actually don't like coming back every twice a, twice a year. Let's do something even a little more permanent. And I say, okay. Is that the one with the, um, it has the remote control? Mm -hmm. kind of? Yep. Yeah, but you're not tied to that remote control. I, I have plenty of women who misplace it or they move and they forgot where it is. Um, you basically put it at a setting and if you're happy at that setting, you don't have to fiddle with it. It's really for like if you need to turn it off because you're going to have a medical procedure or you know something where you need to adjust it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, so does every woman in um, menopause experience something like this? No, they think it's about 50% though. Okay. Um, and, and not everybody correlates their pelvis or bladder symptoms to menopause, but then they'll say, you know, it's been going on for about four years. And I'm like, well, you know, when was menopause? And they're like, well, oh, about three or four years ago. You know, and so it's, they really do kind of then say, oh, you know, something has changed and, and now my bladder's behaving differently. Because the role of estrogen and testosterone in the pelvis is huge. The number one treatment for women with recurrent UTI is not to just give them more antibiotics, it's to put uh, estrogen in their vagina and on their urethra. Because it brings back the pH to premenopausal levels and we want that lactobacillus, we want those good bugs to come in and protect against the bad bugs that cause infection. So the estrogen cream creates that environment again. So you're basically bringing back in the protection you had prior to menopause. And that's very low dose estrogen that doesn't go into your bloodstream. Your breasts don't see it, your blood vessels don't see it. It's really just on the skin. So it brings that pH back to premenopausal, brings back in the lactobacillus, which really acts as a barrier against the E. coli. So it really decreases infections. Okay, um, I think I missed like, um, so when would you put on that cream? Twice a week, it's preventative. So it's like sunscreen, right? You're putting it on to actually prevent something bad from happening. Okay, and when would you, um, when do people feel like that's the time to start using that cream? It depends upon what their goals are, right? So if you have somebody who they already are in that cycle of recurrent urinary tract infections, I just get them started right away. If I have somebody who says, hey, my sex life is very important, I'm worried about increased dryness or increased pain as menopause years go on, then I'd say be proactive about that because that's really important to you. Just start your estrogen cream twice a week just be, to maintain the health of your skin. Okay, and what ages are they, do they need to start thinking about that? 50, 50, 55, yeah. I, it just it's cumulative right kind of like sun damage is cumulative over time just the more years you go without that estrogen the more severe the condition can be so I see plenty of women who are in their 70s who are in their 80s who we start on treatment and they do well but I wonder like had you started 10 years earlier could we have prevented you know it, it getting kind of as bad as it has because the years are just additive mm -hmm. okay so what age would you would you recommend women coming in to start talking to you? 
right? So they can talk to their primary care physician if they want to just kind of get started empirically on it. Um, usually people come to see me because a problem has already started, right? So they come to see me because they say, I have incontinence, I have pain with sex, I have recurrent UTIs, um, and then we kind of get them on a treatment plan. But what's been very exciting is because people now know that this is a place to come to talk about this, is I'm seeing a lot more proactive women who say, hey, I'm, I'm headed into a new relationship. I'm worried that I'm not gonna be as, as healthy down there as I could be. Can, you, can we do an exam? Can we get started? Can we? And so it just it gets me so excited because I'm like, these are women who like, they're proactive. So they're coming in because they want to be as healthy as they can for either for a future relationship or for themselves, if future relationship if they're talking about sex. Um, instead of coming in when it's already kind of gotten to the point where it, it's painful. Um, they say the average woman waits eight years before talking to somebody about their bladder incontinence. And so to see people come in to say, hey, I want to, and more, it's more for sexual function that they come in proactively uh, they don't come in proactively to say, I don't want to leak in the future, right? Um, but it's been super exciting to see those women, and I'm just, I'm so excited to be like, yeah, this is important, and, and like, way for you to, to be in charge of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So I see more preventative visits as far as sexual function goes, but I see, I don't see people, people come in once the leaking's already kind of too bad. 30% um, of diapers sold in America are adult diapers now, and the average person who uses adult diapers spends $80 a month on it. So it's a super expensive problem and, and, and a huge problem. I think, I think the, our culture of shame and saying like a woman's pelvis, her symptoms aren't legitimate or they're, they're, they're normal. I've had plenty of women who've been told in the past that oh, it's just normal to leak after the age of 50. And we say it's not normal, but it's common. Um, just like if you have an abnormal mole, you'd be like, well, that's not normal, but it's common that people have that. Um, because I think if you tell a woman that those things are normal, they're not going to seek care and they're just going to live tied to where's the bathroom or they're not, or they're just going to not do anything to try to have less infections, you know? So to kind of get the word out and to say, these are very common conditions. Clearly if 30% of all diapers in America are sold to adults, mm -hmm. this is a big problem. Um, so it's common, but it's not normal. And certainly there are things we can do. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any specific, um, well, not too specific, but success stories? All the time. <laughs> I mean, that's why, that's why I love what I do is because it's, when you see the success stories and the happy women, um, that's why I keep showing up and doing my job. So as far as incontinence goes, I had one woman, a big, so the you know, big ones that stick into my mind, um, one woman, she was doing diapers for her overactive bladder and she had two garbage pickups a week for her house because of the amount that she was doing. And she did Botox and it worked so well, she canceled a pickup delivery to one a week. And I was like, that's a huge one. You've changed your life so much, you canceled a garbage pickup, mm -hmm. right? So that was, that's still a pretty awesome story. Um, I had just had a lady very recently who was stress incontinence. And I said, hey, look, we're gonna do physical therapy first. If it doesn't work, there's always surgery, but let's, let's make you in charge and, and give you the, you know, the knowledge you need. So she saw one of my physical therapists and came back recently and she's like, I'm totally happy. Uh, and, so, and she was so excited because she didn't need surgery and we were able to fix it and empower her to develop the strength and, and the exercises that she didn't need anything else. So that was a win. Um, always women who come in who have pain with sex or have decreased intimacy because they don't have the relationship that they want with their partner. Um, when we do a multimodal treatment, which is hormones, physical therapy, sometimes sex therapists, a lubrication, and then they come back and they say, we're, we're successful, we're happy. To me, that's just a huge win because there are so many women, I think, that don't speak up and so many women that, that don't have the relationship that they want or they suffer. Uh, and to see to see them come in and be happy and is so rewarding. And then the ladies who don't get infections anymore, urinary tract infections, that's huge. Like when a woman comes in and she's like, ever since I started the vaginal estrogen, I don't have UTIs anymore. That's great because those are so disruptive. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know when it's going to hit. It's usually on a weekend. You have to go into urgent care. You know, you have to be on antibiotics. So 
to kind of break that cycle of recurrent infections for women is really rewarding. Mm -hmm. And they're really painful. Right? Super painful. Yeah. Super painful, yeah. So if they don't seek help, um, it doesn't just go away, is that right? Usually not, usually not. I think if, if you keep doing what you're doing and it's not working, it's not gonna get better, mm -hmm. right? So they usually come and, and I always kind of lay out options and say, hey, this is an option, this is an option. And again, multimodal of sometimes I think it's physical therapy. Sometimes I really think it's hormones. Sometimes I think, you know, I will bring in sex therapists